Well, good morning again, church. I'm Deborah Lemoyne. I'm the executive pastor, if we haven't met. You know, the executive pastor doesn't normally get to pick out the music, but I got to pick that one, and I love it. A Million Little Miracles. Don't they do that beautifully? I love a miracle. Who doesn't love a good miracle story, right? Anybody have a favorite miracle story from the Bible? Favorite miracles? You, everybody knows mine if you've been around long enough. It's Jesus feeding the 5,000. Anything to do with bread is going to be a miracle for me. My children say that no matter what my assigned sermon topic, I will turn it into a sermon about Jesus ter- feeding 5,000 people with bread. But you know, we do love miracle stories. We love this notion that God can do anything, right? We teach it to our children at vacation Bible school and in Sunday school. God is big enough and powerful enough to do anything. But you know, for those of us that believe that, that really truly believe it, it can sometimes create a problem because we can hold a grudge sometimes against God if we believe that God can do anything and yet he hasn't done the thing that we've asked for. Anybody ever pray for something that you didn't get right away exactly the way you wanted it, right? If God can do anything, why doesn't he do whatever we ask? When our relationships hit rough spots or our children struggle or we lose the job or the tumor comes back malignant instead of benign, if we know God can do it, why doesn't he? Or do we look back on a tragedy in our own lives thinking if God could have fixed it, why didn't God fix it? It can be tough, right? I told my husband last week that Tim had a really cool walk-up song and a sermon that was both powerful and short, which creates a tough act to follow, especially if you're not known for being short. Um, And I told my husband that my topic for today was this notion of not getting what we ask for, not having our prayers answered. And my husband told me that I could have managed the whole thing by using the Rolling Stones as my walk-up song, because they answer the question perfectly in seven minutes or less. We can't always get what we ask for, right? We can't always get what we ask for, but why? Why? Church, I do not know. I don't have an answer for you. And I would hesitate to believe anyone who said that they did. You know, St. Augustine once said, Si comprehendis non est Deus, which roughly translates as, if you understand it, it is not God. God is big and powerful. And it's no small wonder that even on our best intellectual days, we can't figure out everything that God does and why God does it. We could spend hours, lifetimes really, dissertations, trying to figure out why God doesn't answer our prayers exactly the way we want him to on exactly our timeline. But I remain confident that God has a better grasp of the arc of humanity's redemption than I do. And for today... We're just going to leave it at that. Because today I want to talk about us. What happens to us? What do we do when we don't get what we want? The truth is sometimes we hold grudges against God, don't we? It's a series on grudges, and we immediately think of the grudges we hold against other people, and Tim talked about that last week. But sometimes, at least for me, I find that I have that persistent feeling of ill will or resentment that defines a grudge. And I learned this week that the etymology of the word grudge is really the same as for the word grouch. We get grouchy when we don't get what we want, right? We grumble and we avoid. Have you ever avoided God for a chapter of life because something went wrong in your life? and you had resentment and sorrow and so much heartbreak that you just avoided? Have you ever avoided church for a chapter of life, right at the time when you needed community the most, because your heart just felt too broken to embrace the community? You know, there is a story in the Bible that I do not particularly enjoy. I would rather tell a miracle story. But this one is out of the Old Testament, and I will tell you right up front, it's a story that makes me grouchy. I almost didn't preach on it, but I think sometimes we need to embrace the passages that make us grouchy as well. This is a story set at the Old Testament at a time when polygamy was accepted as the norm, when a woman's worth was determined entirely by her ability to bring forth male children, and infertility was seen as a sign of divine punishment. This is not 
a recipe for any woman to be happy, much less a woman with fertility problems. And today we're going to unpack the story of a very unhappy woman whose name was Hannah. But Hannah has some important things to teach us. And so we're going to unpack the story together. It comes out of 1 Samuel, and we're just going to take it piece by piece. Once upon a time, 1 Samuel tells us, there was a man named Elkanah, and he had two wives. One wife, her name was Hannah, and the other's wife's name was Penina. And Penina had children, and Hannah did not. And this is where our story begins. It says, year after year, this man, Elkanah, would leave his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of heavenly forces in Shiloh. Whenever he sacrificed, Elkanah would give parts of the sacrifice to his wife Penina and to all her sons and all her daughters. But he would give only one part of it to Hannah, though he loved her, because the Lord had kept her from conceiving. You can see how well this is going for Hannah already, right? But it gets worse. It gets worse. Because the Lord had kept Hannah from conceiving, the story tells us, her rival, the other wife, Penina, would make fun of her mercilessly just to bother her. So this is what took place year after year. Whenever Hannah went to the Lord's house, Penina would make fun of her. Then Hannah would cry, and she wouldn't eat anything. Really think about that line. You know that feeling when you cry so hard and you're so upset that you can't even eat? In my family, when you cry so hard, you can't eat. Something's really wrong. Hannah's really upset here. Here's how her husband responds. He says, Hannah, why are you crying? Why won't you eat? Why are you so sad? Some translations say downhearted, and I like that word even better. That notion that you're so sad and upset that you feel like your heart actually falls down into your stomach and makes you sick, downhearted. I had a therapist once that called that emotional vomiting, and I've always remembered that phrase. You know that feeling when you're so emotionally upset it makes you physically ill? But he says, why are you so sad? Aren't I worth more to you than ten sons? Her husband doesn't get it. He's clueless. He is clueless about what is happening and what Penina is doing to her. I'm sure none of our husbands would ever be this clueless. But Elkanah just doesn't get it. I'm not going to say anything bad about my husband today. He brought me a cold brew when we ran out of coffee this morning. So he's on the A-list. But sometimes, sometimes we don't get it. So Hannah, not being understood by Penina or by her husband, she goes to God. And her prayer is not pretty here. And I think this is a critical part of the story. This is verse 10, and it's translated in different ways. In the CEB, which we generally read from, it says, Hannah was very upset and couldn't stop crying as she prayed to the Lord. The NIV gives it a little more depth and says, In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord with the weeping bitterly. But I really appreciated the way Eugene Peterson translates this in the message. He says, Crushed in her soul. Hannah prayed to God and cried and cried inconsolably. She was crushed in her soul. And remember how long this has been going on. Remember that line from the very beginning? Year after year. How many years is that? We can't be sure, but it's years after years enough that Penina has had multiple sons and multiple daughters. So many years this has been going on. When the Old Testament talks about years and years... It can mean a really long time. Hannah has lost her patience. She's lost her cool. Her soul has been crushed by the way she's being treated, not just her infertility, but the cruelty of Penina and the cluelessness of her husband. And while she probably couldn't name it nearly as well as Barbie and Ken in the Barbie movie, if you saw it this weekend, she's feeling a little crushed by this system of patriarchy that has her trapped in this life she would not have chosen for herself. And so she cries and she cries so hard that the priest in the temple, Eli, thinks she's drunk. Hear the compassionate response that Hannah gets from her pastor on this day. How long will you act like a drunk? Sober up, Eli says. And Hannah says, no, this whole time I've been praying out of my great worry and my trouble. She's so upset. She's crying so hard that even the priest doesn't understand her. Have you ever cried so hard that you can't get your words out? Nobody even knows what's wrong. That's what we're talking about here. She has been upset for years, and she lets God have it. The years of pain and anxiety 
and sorrow and uncertainty, she just lets God have it. This is ugly, mad, snotting, sobbing, crying that Hannah is doing. Crying so hard that no one can understand her. And lest we think that this is just an emotional woman with a woman's emotional problem, let's remember King David when he didn't get his way in battle. What does King David do in the Psalms? He cries out to the Lord. We know these words. How long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? King David cries out to God when he doesn't get what he wants and he's afraid. Remember Paul, who tells us in Scripture, the great apostle, so much faith, so many beautiful passages, but he cries out to God over and over, he says, that God will remove the thorn from his side. Paul's so upset about whatever this physical ailment is that he can't even write it down. We still don't know exactly. But he cries out to God, asking God to remove it. Remember Jesus in the garden at the end of his life. What does he pray to God? Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. Jesus and Paul, David, they all cry out too. We don't always get what we want. If David and Paul and Jesus didn't get exactly what they wanted, if Hannah suffered all those years before having children, probably, friends, you and I are occasionally not going to get what we want when we want it either. And we don't have to be happy about it. We don't have to hide our emotions from God. God did not stop loving Hannah or David or Paul or Jesus because they cried out with emotion, and he won't stop loving us either. Here's a true confession. I yell at God in my car when I get angry. That is my spot. I have said things to God in my car that are not fit to preach. I have unloaded, and I have cried snotty tears just like Hannah I have bargained with God like a toddler holding her breath trying to get her way. I am always willing to admit that God is in charge, but I sometimes believe that God needs an admin assistant and that I should be the admin assistant. I have submitted my resume multiple times. I've never even got a call back. I have not gotten the job, and I still haven't gotten what I wanted. But no matter how angry I was, how much I yelled, I still loved God, and I know God still loved me. God would rather hear you yell than see you walk away. And I think that's the lesson that Hannah has to teach us. Hannah never walked away. After all that crying, she tries something that many of us have tried. Any of you ever done this? Have you ever tried to cut a bargain with God? Oh, yeah, I hear the laughter. Dear God. If you will give me what I want, I'll go to church every Sunday forever, right? I'll tithe. I'll feed the hungry. I'll even volunteer to teach Sunday school. I'll never yell at you in my car again. Just give me what I want. So many of us have tried that. Hannah, friends, she tries it too. Hannah makes this promise. Lord of heavenly forces, just look at your servant's pain and remember me. Don't forget your servant. Give her a boy. Then I'll give him to the Lord for her in his entire life. How's that for a promise? At this point, Hannah and Eli discuss for a moment. And when Eli is finally convinced that Hannah isn't just drunk after all, he says, then go in peace. And may the God of Israel give you what you've asked from him. Then listen to what scripture tells us about how Hannah leaves the temple that day. It says, then the woman went on her way, ate some food, and wasn't sad any longer. Hannah wasn't sad any longer. Now, here's the thing. Her circumstances hadn't changed. She walks back out of that temple with her prayer as yet unanswered. She walks right back into the reality show of her life with Penina and Elkanah, still childless, still harassed and misunderstood. And yet somehow, Scripture tells us, she was not sad any longer. Why? 
Because the very act of taking it to God, all of that snotting, crying emotion, allowed her to get back up, face the world, and keep going. Because in the gap between what she had and what she wanted, she put love, just like Tim told us last week, into that gap. In the gap between what she had in the moment and what she wanted in the future, she put love. She didn't lie about her feelings or try to hide them. She let God have it all. But she didn't stop loving despite her hurt feelings. She didn't give up on God, and she didn't give up on hope. Scripture tells us that the next day she and her entire family got up and worshipped the Lord once more. Once more such a tiny phrase, but I think it's really critical. Even when we don't get what we want, we get up and we worship the Lord once more. One more time, one more day, one more year, we get up and we worship. Sometimes, friends, we do it with tears in our eyes, but we get up and we worship the Lord once more. And I think, I think that's a miracle In itself. Scripture tells us that in due time, however many years due time it may have been, Hannah had that son. And the minute she weans him, she takes him to the temple and she hands him over to God just like she promised. And I have to imagine she probably cried more tears then, wouldn't you think? The child is named Samuel. And he goes on to be a critically important part of God's story at a critical moment in time. His birth is not too late and not too early. And you know, Samuel's birth may seem like the big miracle in the story, but I think it took a million little miracles for Hannah to hang on long enough to get to that point, to persevere in prayer even when she didn't get what she wanted on the schedule she thought she deserved. Hannah held on. You know, there's a church family going through a hard time right now. I'm not going to say their names online, but they gave me permission to share the story, so if you recognize them, it's okay. And in this family, the much-loved grandfather had a bad stroke some time ago. And this is a faithful family through all the generations, so they have prayed for complete healing. Good, faithful, earnest prayers from a good, faithful, earnest family. And healing completely has not yet come. And I called last week to check on the family, and I spoke to the daughter-in-law, and she said something interesting. She had no idea what I was preaching on. She said, you know what the miracle is? She said, my mother-in-law just keeps hanging on. She told me that before they left the hospital, her mother-in-law hid in the bathroom and prayed to God that God would give her the strength every day, just one day at a time, to get through and to take care of him. And she said that her mother-in-law's strength and perseverance and faith in the midst of this has inspired her and her children and her other daughter and the families around them. Generations are impacted by that sort of faith. You know, it might be a different sort of miracle, but I think it's a miracle just the same. Sometimes, church, the miracle is inside of us. Sometimes God transforms us even before our circumstances are transformed. I think of something Albert Einstein said. He said, there are only two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle, and the other is as though everything is a miracle. I like the second option better. Friends, I'm a breast cancer survivor about to see the birth of her first grandchild. It is all a miracle to me. You know, I haven't gotten all the things I yelled at God about in my car. I suspect I'm never going to. We may not get everything we want exactly when we want it. But instead of holding a grudge, look at everything we do have. Unmerited grace from a God that loves us. The creation around us, our very lives, the person sitting next to you, look back on your life with gratitude and look forward with hope, 
even when you don't get everything you want. When you're tempted to hold a grudge, put love in the gap because you know that's what God is doing. What did God do when there was a gap between who God wanted us to be and who we really are? What did God put in the gap? Jesus. For God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son. No grudges. No grudges. Keep praying for the big miracles, church. Don't hear me say not to pray for the big miracles. God does amazing things. And God's delays are not always denials. God's time is not our own. And the time we spend waiting, it is never wasted time. I have sat in hospitals with families when prayers for healing were answered. And I have sat in hospitals when prayers for healing were not answered. But I have never walked away thinking that those prayers had been wasted. Prayer transforms us. It gives us eyes of gratitude and hope. It gives us strength and perseverance. It allows us to endure, to outlast, to be people of faith no matter what comes. It helps us to open our eyes to see the miracles all around us. I'm going to call the band back up. And when they play again, I just invite you to really hear the words of that song that takes us out of worship. There are a million little miracles in our lives. Grace we don't deserve, breath in our lungs, the strength to keep going another day. And pray a prayer of gratitude for all of them. Let's pray together as they come back up. Good and gracious God, we don't always get what we want when we want it. And we put our trust and our faith in you. And we ask you to empower us with a sense of trust and faith and hope and grace. Help us to put love in the gap, just as you always put love in the gap with us. Help us love one another as you've taught us to love. Help us to be the miracle, to embrace the miracle, to see the miracles all around us. In Jesus' name, amen.